podcasts. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Hello and welcome to The Profile, here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Megan Cornwell. This is the show where we delve into a person's life, faith and ministry. It's brought to you in association with the UK's leading Christian magazine, Premier Christianity. If you would like a free sample copy of our latest issue, head to our website, premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. Today on The Profile, I'm speaking with Simon Gilbo. Simon has spent over two decades as a missionary in Burundi where he faced a civil war and regular death threats. He is passionate about encouraging Christians to make our lives count, and one way he spreads this message is through the various books he has written, including More Than Conquerors and Choose Life, 365 readings for radical disciples. I caught up with him earlier this year at the Christian festival New Wine, where he was speaking about evangelism. Listen in. So, Simon, you've been out in the mission field in Africa for several decades now, seeing God move in incredible ways. But let's go back to where it all began. Tell me about how you became a Christian. Well, I was brought up by um, two very loving parents. My dad was a... uh, um, He'd rejected Christ. He was brought up in Africa and had rejected Christ, but married this lovely lady who came to faith when I was five. So my mum came to faith when I was five. She brought me up going to churches. I found it very boring. Uh, And then when I was 15, she forced me off on a script union youth camp and she said I'll only make you go once if you don't like it Uh, I'll never make you go again and I went begrudgingly and I came back saying I will go every Easter and every summer for the rest of my life and I did that for 10 years so I did manage to go literally every Easter and every summer to a a camp called Ewan in Dorset and it was I was a private school educator so it was a private school boys camp very um, brilliant gospel work and that coupled with a Christian meeting at school meant that I manage, you know, I'd I'd be on fire for a few weeks and then I'd go back and start school getting up to mischief and no good and you know, drunkenness and treating girls not very well that sort of stuff but that just kept me in the game so I'm very passionate about uh, summer camps because that's very formative for me And then when you were in your 20s, you first went to Burundi and at that time it was ranked as one of the most dangerous countries in the world what compelled a privately school educated young man with the world ahead of him to go to somewhere like that well it's interesting because I was in a good job well just backtracking a bit I I drove a truck from England to Kenya in 1997 I think it was you know 15 countries a crazy experience and at the end of that trip jumped on a matatu a taxi and went across Kenya Uganda Rwanda and Burundi because my family history I'm I'm now fourth generation I've worked in Burundi so there was a, a context there so I wanted to do the family route thing and I went to Burundi, I, I saw where my great-grandfather was buried, and I thought, right, well, I'll never go back. It's, uh, uh, it's a land that's received the gospel, and I wanted to go to a, a country that had never heard of Jesus at all. You know, people were, really didn't have a clue. So that was my heart's desire. And I felt the Lord had called me to C- Cambodia during that time, and that, that didn't work out. I went there, sought him, and uh, it didn't work out. And then I was, in, so I was in this good job, and this guy tracked me down. I'd never met him before, and he said, I believe God sent me to you, and he wants you to go to Burundi, and be involved in youth and mission and evangelism. And so I had been praying, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. So that there's context there again. And I said, look, I'll do anything, I'll go anywhere. I don't want security, I just want to be in your will. I, I wanted to, to experience the workplace to understand people's pressures, but I didn't want to um, end up, I think, I, I'd already started speaking and preaching at schools and universities and seen that that was a gift and knew that the Lord would probably use that. So um, that guy came, I thought, well, either he's a nut job or he's been sent by God. So I said to him, all right, thanks, weirdo, I'll think about it, I'll be spiritual, I'll pray about it. I went back to my job, I was in front of the computer, said, right, God, right now in front of the computer, if you want me to go to Burundi, well, that means leaving family, friends, security, career, everything, and going to a place where I might get killed and people have tried to kill me. So give me a radical sign right now in front of the computer if you want me to take this radical change of career. That was the prayer, very specific. Give me a radical sign right now in this marketing job that's got nothing to do with Burundi if you want me to go to Burundi. And I didn't wait long and I took a phone call and a friend called up and out the blue he said, do you know anyone who wants to work in Burundi? And that was it. That was literally my my life direction just swung on that sentence because I'd asked for a radical sign and, and God gave it and you know people often say to me I've been praying that prayer of surrender and 
I haven't had a phone call and uh, you know I thank God that he was very clear I think maybe in very extremes I have been through some quite extreme stuff it's nice to know that you know that you know that you're in the right place but you know God's speaking the whole time sometimes dramatically more often I think just uh, if we get off social media and just listen to him or all the competing voices for our time in the quietness as we study the scriptures through common sense through sermon through books you know he's speaking the whole time we just got to slow down and listen and we don't need a wacky answer to prayer but we do need to pray that prayer which is that prayer of surrender I'll do anything I'll go anywhere that's what he wants for, from each one of us and then the rest is uh, is his call and we can respond in obedience or not you once said that you didn't think you'd make it past 30 you're now in your mid 40s tell me about some of the dangerous situations that God's brought you through yeah, so particularly, I went out in 1998, 99 to 2003, it was the most dangerous country in the world. I know that because my mum sent me through the newspaper cutting, and there we were at number one. I don't know if she was trying to encourage me, but uh, I would drive up roads, and uh, you know, one time 40 people were killed, and we got through. I had a guy come to my house with a grenade to blow me up. He'd written me a letter saying he's going to cut out my eyes. So those were kind of the more extreme experiences. I remember preaching and once uh, in a... In a displacement camp in a living hell that 10 people are dying every day on average for weeks and months and uh, the rebels had just sent down the chopped off heads of soldiers they'd killed and they were just a few hundred yards up the hill and um, and the guy said right you need to get out of here and I got my motorbike and came across the soldiers with a look of that look in their eyes and blood on the road and so very very intense and, and uh, you know very heightened sense of the gift of life and wanted to maximize every single minute and when you live expecting to die it's a great way to live people think sometimes when I say that that I'm a nut job but no it was like you know if you live expecting to die then you prioritize people over stuff you want to have short counts you want to resolve any grudges you've got with anyone you want to receive and offer forgiveness you don't get excited about stuff because stuff you're not going to take with you Um, C.S. Lewis said anything which is internal is eternally out of date and yet people get, in general get so excited about stuff um, and uh, yeah it's misplaced priority so lots of key life lessons that came out of it and I'm very grateful for those early years they were very extreme but also very fruitful because we would drive along roads and, and we'd get to places and no one was going there so NGOs non-governmental organisations the UN they would fly over those areas and uh, and avoid them but people were dying in those areas and they needed Jesus so uh, when we arrived they're like well how you've come no one else has come so you, you're probably worth listening to so sort of masses of fruit and uh, so this was was this just after the civil war well the civil war in its well it was a 13 year civil war but it was um, 1993 was a genocide of maybe 300,000 people no maybe 150,000 people and then in the next 12 years another 150,000 people might have died so it was a more trickle genocide Rwanda started after Burundi and very much linked to Burundi in fact it used to be one country Rwanda Rundi so Burundi's genocide was was November 1993 and then Rwanda was particularly three months from April May June of 1994 but Rwanda's was quite quickly resolved over a few years whereas Burundi's just carried on for 13 years and what did these people think of this white man turning up in their villages in the middle of nowhere how were you received well I'm sure it was novelty uh, but beyond that it was I'd I'd been learning the language I mean obviously I wasn't very good in the first couple of years um, and it's come subsequently uh, more and more but it was like wow you know we Rundi even means the other so it's almost like the other place even from around it's like it's forgotten and no one was coming so it was it was a massive sign of of hope that they weren't forgotten and uh, there was there was no negative in the mix uh, I mean there might have been from the authorities that were conceivably thinking you know is he going you know, to report this internationally the abuse is going on but from people out there they were, they were very responsive very receptive and yeah it was such a dark time and so grim but you know it's in the darkest places that the light shines brightest that's a cliche but it's very very true and uh, I've never felt more alive than you know I'd, I'd drive along and often on a motorbike which is even more even more dangerous but you know I was 24, 25, 26 and I was like I am so ready to go to glory Philippians one twenty one for me to live as Christ to die as gain Paul says what shall I desire I actually desire to depart and be with Christ which is better by far but convince there's more work for me to do I'll be around a bit longer so I'll be driving along with my Burundian soulmate Freddie behind me on a motorbike with our matching shades we bought for one pound from the market and singing 
praises to God in, in the Switzerland of Africa in the mountains, thinking, if we die right now, what a great way to go. It was so extreme and full on. And, you know, the Lord honoured that. We didn't die. Um, Freddie was convinced that we wouldn't die. I was convinced we would die. Um, and he's been proved right so far. But it was, it was, it's worth living and dying for. Have you had any psychological repercussions from those times? Have you needed to have any um, counselling or any sort of post-traumatic stress? Well, praise the Lord, uh, unless I'm sort of so screwed up that I can't even recognise it and so unaware, I've, I've, I've had some evaluations and I think what was healthy was that I've always had very close people to bounce stuff off and I've cried a lot. So, I mean, sometimes, actually more in 2015 when after 10 years of peace it kicked off again, in 2015 I would often weep during preaching and, 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 it was, and so it wasn't bottled up. And uh, and so even you know just a few weeks ago we did a family evaluation actually coming back trying to more than box tick but do the right thing by by my kids who've also listened to gunfire go off and seen a few things they haven't seen dead bodies I don't think but uh, you know they've seen a few things some violence um, and I thank the Lord from the bottom of my heart that uh, they're thirteen ten and nine and my wife and we were spared uh, anything really heavy which is which is gross yeah. It's interesting what you're saying about crying and weeping because obviously here in the West, you know, if men do that, that's seen as a sign of weakness. Can you tell me a bit more about that? Yes. Um, well, it's interesting because Burundian men never cry, and there's a Burundian proverb which says, "Amasuzi yumurundi achatema munda," which means that the tears of a man fall in his stomach. And uh, so it's, it's. I just think it's so utterly important to, to part of being human. You know, it, 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 tears are a gift. They're a gift of, of you know, being able to release. Um, it's like you blow a gasket if you don't. And I think, yeah, our culture is probably not as extreme as Burundi in terms of not allowing tears. But I, I, I love the fact that I do cry. And having gone to, you know, I went to Harrow School, very sort of stiff. Uh, stiff upper lip kind of public school upbringing and a key moment in my life was when I was teacher, teaching when I was 18 in South Africa and I was at this farm school and it was the most miserable time of my life it was so hard I lived in the middle of nowhere by myself 18 years old very unhealthy I was an extreme extrovert and living by myself it was so lonely and at the end of that year they, at the farewell do with this, this class they, they the school, a sort of third of them burst into tears because um, they didn't want me to go, and I, I wanted to cry. I thought, well, I, you know, I can't cry. I've, I've never cried, never cried. And I went home, and I had this card that they'd all written with all their rubbish English, which showed how badly I taught them on it. And um, and I read through, and I said, I want to cry. And I actually, I, I made myself cry, and it was absolute breakthrough in terms of thinking no it's not wrong to cry and then can cry in fact to be a real man you, you, sh- you, you should cry otherwise you're you're not fully who you were made to be and so uh, that's I think that's been a key part of my healing or, or, or not needing uh, healing on that level you're the founder of Great Lakes Outreach a charity that works with local organizations in, in Burundi to preach the gospel and alleviate poverty tell us about how that organization came about well, it's funny because I started off out there under the bread of Scripture Union. I was converted to the Scripture Union. I wanted to work with Scripture Union. The Lord very clearly lined that up um, through quite a t- tortuous process, which is a long story but beautiful. Again, just knowing that God had lined things up the way He had, and and yet after a few years, I was just beginning to identify other great people to get behind. And it, there was one tipping point when I sent out an email saying to my you know, a few hundred friends saying guys I'm feeling overwhelmed this is all the things we're involved in we're involved in this orphanage and student ministry and script union and uh, street kid stuff and uh, does any, could anyone just help me out because I'd gone out as a volunteer I wasn't really box ticking I was really I was with a mission organization but they didn't like me enough to really want, want you know I was, I was a bit of a, a risk for them maybe um, and and the response to that email was about 100 direct debits um, of 30 quid, 40 quid, 10 quid a month. And suddenly um, I actually became an Al-Qaeda suspect because uh, I was the stereotypical profile of an Al-Qaeda uh, character because I was getting all hundreds of direct debits on my personal account. And then I think my record was taking out 78 grand in cash um, because there was no banking system out there. And so... Um, 
we got some fishy calls at home. Who are you, you weirdo? And 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 and, and event, when, once they established that I was vaguely kosher, they said, could you be more transparent and set up an organisation? And so with the blessing of the mission sending organisation, they actually said you're kind of getting too big for us um, in terms of how much money is coming in. So we bless you to set up your own thing. That was the birth, 2003, having gone out in 1998, that was the birth of Great Lakes Outreach. And so we, it's really just to stop you getting a criminal record. Yes, yes, and, and, and being transparent above board, and you know, our vision is to identify the best local leaders of passion, integrity, gifting, and vision for the transformation of the nation. And it is, honestly, it's, it's just absolutely beautiful, because Burundi is so poor and has got so many problems, but some of God's best troops are in Burundi. And all they need is resourcing and empowering and equipping to do unbelievably beautiful stuff. So right now, as we speak, 700 evangelists are out there for two weeks and 35 different teams. And they will be, you know, different culture and context uh, to, to England and, and most of the listeners. But they will be casting out demons and healing the sick. And witch doctors will be burning their charms publicly, submitting to the highest power. And some will get beaten up, some will get put in prison. And I know that because we've done this for the last 14 years. The ministry reckons from, through that outreach, we've seen 164,000 people come to Jesus. It is absolutely mind-blowing. I mean, I, I suppose I am boasting for them. It's not me doing it. I mean, we've, we've sort of equipped them to go. But uh, in terms of stuff on the planet, that's probably about as fruitful. I hope there's other stuff more fruitful than that. But it's about as fruitful as anything I know of in terms of seeing uh, mass, masses of people come to Christ. You know, A witch doctor burning his chance publicly, submitting to the highest power because he's just been literally knocked over by the power of Jesus. Uh, and so 50 people on the spot giving their lives to Christ. Or in one incident, um, uh, a young man being pronounced dead in hospital and mum starts wailing, his tubes are removed, he's covered by a sheet. One of our guys comes in, hears the wailing. In this incident, feels led by the Spirit of God to speak life back into that body declares life he sits back up words gets around the hospital 40 people give their lives to Christ so there's lots of you know, really extraordinary stories why do you think people are so receptive to the gospel in Burundi well I think they've just got virtually nothing else it's the, it's the hungriest country in the world it's got the highest rate of malnutrition it's in the bottom three in terms of poverty but once you're in the bottom ten you're not fighting over much you know it's just desperately grim and suffering and there's there's one dentist for a million people there's one doctor for a bit more, a bit fewer people, but uh, you know. So here, you're sick straight away. You've got access to uh, you know, the NHS over there. There isn't that access, so there's a greater need, level of dependency, hunger. Uh, there's no cynicism uh, with God's religion. It's a very theistic worldview. So I, I think I've only ever met in 21 years out there one self-proclaimed atheist in Burundi you know they've all they all know they've been brought up with witchcraft and, and they said God they know that God whatever God is is real and so and they're hungry it's a very hungry spiritually hungry environment can you share some more of those miraculous stories that you were beginning to tell us about yeah um, so one lady uh, our team showed up and she um, basically said F off to the team, said we're not interested in what you've got to say, and so they were retreating respectfully, and then as they retreated, um, she said, all right, hang, hang on, come back, I'll let you talk to my village, but first of all, heal this demon-possessed girl. So essentially what she was saying was don't just talk a good game, show us the power. Now, some of the listeners won't even believe in demons, and that's because we've all got our different worldviews, and we think our lens, our glasses, uh, the way we see reality is reality, but we've all got different blind spots. And this story, let this story just challenge you, because let's just say she wasn't demon possessed. let's say she was just mentally ill, which is what a secular materialistic worldview would say of someone who is demon possessed and demons are in the Bible and Jesus is the same yesterday today and forever so you know Satan hasn't been around forever but he's been around a long time um, so this girl anyway as they prayed for her the whole village came to watch and they prayed over in Jesus name with all these different guttural men's utterances you know that came out of this precious young girl's body and she was set free and again you know a mentally ill person wouldn't have those men's sort of deep guttural utterances so that was a demon she was set free well on the spot that lady who a few moments earlier saying f off and another 20 people in that village uh, falling to their knees giving their lives to christ beautiful a friend of mine agnes she was deaf dumb blind and curled up into a ball like a vegetable for seven years and i'm sure loads of people prayed for her over those years but on one occasion a bunch of young people came and prayed over her in jesus name and her whole body uncoiled and she got her sight back and her hearing back and the one thing that still hadn't come was her speech so she, she was still mute 
Um, but she's like, surely the Lord's not going to stop there. So she joined the church choir by faith. And then three weeks later, the Lord released her tongue to sing his praises, and she will not shut up. She's a turbocharged uh, evangelist. She's actually an ordained Anglican minister out there. You can't deny a story. So you guys listening, you can come out and you can meet Agnes. And everyone knew her as the vegetable. She's been on national radio and testified those stories. So we have all these stories coming out. And then those guys go on, on the radio or on TV because, uh, yeah, I mean, we've all got a different story. It doesn't have to be that dramatic. But I'd say to anyone who's like nervous about sharing their own faith it's like just you know you were depressed and now Jesus lifted you out of that depression or maybe you're still depressed but you know you're just about hanging in there because you know Jesus is with you and whatever our story is um, no one it's, it's the most effective bullet you've got to fire in terms of you know he's in, I've had an encounter with him and uh, you can have that too going back to what you just said Simon about the person who um, had this demon possessed do you think that all mental illness is demon possession or do you think there are some instances where it is just a psychological issue do you think there's always a spiritual element to it yeah well thanks for asking that question in, in case I'd given in any way the impression that I was equating them because I'm absolutely not no there, there's there's demon possession and there's, there's mental illness and they are there might be some overlap on some of them but they are distinct categories and if you're mentally ill you go to the doctor and if it's right they'll prescribe drugs and drugs are, you know, will treat a medical, physical condition whereas the problem is with people that don't acknowledge the spiritual is that when someone who is demon possessed which is completely different comes to someone that doesn't have that framework then they will pre- prescribe a physical remedy for a spiritual issue and that's where it simply is not going to work and how do you discern personally when it is a demon possession? Does well, God speak to you specifically well, about that? You know, I, I wouldn't even say that I'm massively gifted in that area. Uh, but it, you know, some people are very gifted uh, to identify. And I think as you speak, I mean, I've done, I've done street evangelism in the West, for example. In, 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 I remember working in Germany in the red light district in an area that was so evil, but it wasn't recognised as evil. It's recognised as tourists. Um, you know, tourists would come along and it was so evil what was going on and we do street evangelism and I, and I would have been talking to a person beforehand and then when I started preaching Jesus that person suddenly manifested with demons because then it was a real, there was a real clash of kingdoms going on so I think um, so it wasn't just that somebody was disagreeing with you no what's the difference it was, it was fierce well just uh, extraordinary levels of anger physical aggression you know, you, you, I think you wouldn't suddenly, from being nice, you wouldn't suddenly spit at someone or smack them, which I had the joy of receiving. Um, so, um, and then, and then, yeah, having different voices speaking through that person. I mean, I, we sh- so shouldn't get overly obsessed about this sort of stuff. In terms of, uh, you know, for, for most people, it's far removed from their frame of reference. But you know, it's very unhealthy to to. to some people get unhealthily interested in these things, and we we should just, I suppose what I would like to bring back from Africa is people I think people are so they don't see much uh, of the spiritual dimension in things some people see a demon under every stone that's uh, that's the other end of the spectrum which you mustn't do but I think the problem for a western Christian in general is that his over secularized is an over secularized view of things and not seeing uh, the spiritual dimension to what is going on in a country like Burundi which is one of the poorest and also ranked one of the unhappiest how do you choose who to help? Wow, that's a really good question. Uh, because, yeah, the needs are everywhere. I remember a crippled lady coming to my house and I gave her $28, which, you know, was like a month's salary. Um, and, and so the next day she came back with six people. And so that was that just didn't work. You know, it did not work. And it meant that I had to say, right, well, we can't, can't take anyone not going to give out money at my home in fact that was some of the source of my death threats actually there was a guy coming to my house who, who probably had PTSD or was demon possessed I don't know um, but um, it's very very difficult and, and I think you just it's the spirit of God hopefully communicating because the needs are everywhere and then working out what is helpful so another story I remember loving the fact that all these street kids were coming to my office and uh, they were all my buddies and I, I knew them by name we were having fun and and, uh, and then I realised actually that they, sh- they could have been at school, but because of well-intentioned muppets like myself who were giving them money, 
um, it, their parents were preferring that they go on the streets to get money rather than go to school. So that's, there's a book called When, when Helping Hurts. So that's a classic example of ignorance, uh, well-intentioned ignorance. So I think um, what, what, where we've been successful is that we've identified the best local people to work with and through, and it's very unhelpful just to give money ad hoc in general and lots of people come out on short term teams and they are very unhelpful because they're unwise in terms of how they give money and money is so loaded in a very poor country and they can quickly detract from well you can take someone out completely from their their vision or their calling because they just uh, have urgent needs so it needs real wisdom real discernment and uh, I thank the Lord that we've just got great people to channel stuff through who are on the ground doing beautiful work so has it been a sort of trial and error for you, making mistakes and then learning from those mistakes? Yes, I mean, I've definitely, definitely made mistakes. I think um, the, the challenge or, or the aim is to make as few mistakes as possible. And I think most people come in with, a, again, a Western worldview. And some countries uh, have a more can-do spirit than others. So I don't want to slag off our guys, our friends across the pond, but they come in often straight away and, and I'm saying, just listen, just listen, just observe and don't uh, dictate what you think is the best course of action. You have no understanding of the cultural context. Um, and in humility uh, and taking the time, patience, because you'll always have the poor with you, Jesus said, didn't he? And so they'll, they'll always be poor. So but, but what is the Lord saying? And what is most strategic? Which is very, very difficult because there are immediate raw needs in front of you. And, and you think, you, you feel guilty that you know, you're not going through the same levels of pain. So how dare you not give everything to everyone straight away? How do you cope with that feeling? That, well, that's probably the hardest thing to, to deal with. And in terms of, I mean, each year I've had a privilege I suppose all more because of having a preaching ministry internationally is that I've got out for two months each summer it's also the hottest months out there and so in terms of life rhythm that's been very fruitful because I come out and it's not that I forget what's going on but I don't have people lining up in my office every day with stories that would be front page news if it was a white person um, but because it's, it's not so it's a Burundian and there are so many of them going through that sort of stuff that and um, that is very draining to listen to and yet you have to give each person the time and the compassion the dignity if you like to say yeah I'll listen to your story but that, that is very draining and, and I look around at other uh, colleagues from the westerners that come in and, and there's a huge amount of depression and burnout and stress because it's so difficult and I suppose I thank God that I've had people holding to account that I've had regular breaks I mean when I first went out there the NGO guys, they weren't allowed to stay in the country more than six weeks in a row. They had to leave for five days to decompress. Now, I didn't have that luxury, and I didn't have any money, so, you know, I was there straight off all, all the way for a few years, but um, I thank the Lord that, you know, guarding our own time, playing tennis, um, you know, I'm, I'm a sportsman, so just making sure, and that is, that is not a luxury, that is a priority to mental health. That brings us to the end of part one of today's show. But join us again to hear more from Simon Gilbo right after this. Premier Christianity magazine. Are you fed up with fake news or bored of bad stories? We think it's time for something different. I'm Sam Hales, editor of Premier Christianity magazine. Every month, our team publishes stories of lives transformed, testimonies, miracles, healings, and loads more good news. We're here to encourage you, excite you, and keep you up to date with all that God is doing through His church. That's why we're proud to bring you a magazine that's different. For your free copy, visit premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. The Profile. You're listening to Premier Christian Radio. Welcome back to The Profile, here on Premier Christian Radio with me, Megan Cornwell, Deputy Editor of Premier Christianity magazine. That's the monthly magazine that sponsors this show. If you would like a free sample copy of our latest issue, just go to premierchristianity.com forward slash free sample. But now it's time to rejoin my interview with Simon Gilbo. Let's listen in. In terms of your family, Simon, you've got three children. What's it been like to raise children in a conflict zone? Well, it's interesting because we've just moved back to England this year and all of them want to go back to Burundi. 
not that they're unhappy here but I'm so glad that they all love Burundi that they're not going to meet those screwed up missionary kids that were like oh what did you do to us and raising us in a war zone so they've all got great memories we had incredible freedom out there I mean not freedom for them to be out at dark or to walk along the streets even but, but um, you know they had a cross cultural education they, they speak French fluently we got to travel around you know, five countries in East Africa um, see you know every sort of lion and and elephant and rhino you know I mean all sorts of just stuff that are people's life dreams um, and uh, and I think that there's no scarring at all I mean they, they during the 2015 conflict yeah they listened to gunfire Lizzie had to diffuse a st- situation a street fight when she was trying to get through a roadblock and she pretended to, pretended to be you know Wonder Woman flexing her muscles because there was a the guy was, who was helping her got beaten up and put the rocks back in to stop them going through and she took that judgment call will they beat up a white woman in public I don't think so she, so she carried on removing the rocks and got through and, and so you know a few, a few things like that which again we recently went on this debriefing week and uh they're, 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 they're not scarred by it at all I think they've just had uh, an incredibly privi- privileged upbringing I mean I did fall on my knees on the on the asphalt on the um, airport floor before getting on the plane and I just shouted out to God I said thank you Lord it's like because the biggest cost that I was expecting I was ready to die then you, I married my wife said are you ready to be a young widow that was the proposal and she bought into that but the kids didn't buy into it, so the, the heaviest thing was thinking, Lord, will this, is Lizzie going to get raped? Are they going to be killed? Are they going to be traumatised? And so the fact is that things can go wrong in England now we live here, but people won't say, you idiot, you, how could you do that? And, and so I was always vaguely living under that potential accusation. And so I was just so grateful. Thank you, Lord, that they're safe, that they're mentally on an even keel. And again, I, it's all it's all grace because you know it's not a given at all. I've got a, fr- a friend right now. We're paying for their children. Her, the child who's got cerebral meningitis and medevaced out to Nairobi right now. Is she going to live? You know, you have to count the cost, and, and we have counted the cost. When you count it by other people, that's even heavier responsibility. So, yeah, being being a follower of Jesus, you know, didn't promise us an easy journey. It's not cliche. It promised us a safe arrival. So I always thought I'd die in one of those ambushes. They would just get people out and shoot them and nick all their clothes. And in one of those ambushes, a guy called John, he got his head sort of shattered, a bullet went through his face, and he didn't, didn't die. Uh, I don't know what happened to the other guys, but he got multiple reconstructive surgeries for it, and yet he could never speak again. His mouth it was a bit of a mangled mess, but his eyes could do a lot of talking. And he took a piece of paper and a pen and he wrote, God never promised us an easy journey, just a safe arrival. And uh, I don't know what you know each listener's discipleship journey is looking like but he, Jesus didn't say it's going to be easy he said in this world you will have trouble but take heart I have overcome the world and that's why we are more than conquerors I wrote a book called More Than Conquerors which is a call to radical discipleship and we are more than conquerors but it's not triumphalistic it's triumphant because we are more than conquerors that's verse 37 that comes the other side of verse 35 where Paul writes who shall separate us from the love of God shall trouble hardship persecution famine nakedness danger sword no in all these things we are more than conquerors but it's no soft sell to come and follow Jesus that's for sure and talking about that radical Christian life what steps do you take personally to ensure that you're choosing faith rather than fear in your everyday decision making yeah well, I mean it's interesting because that is one of my key things to always come back to I just uh, it, every decision that I think if most people assess their decision, their last significant decision, you know, not what did they have on their taste for breakfast, like what meaty decision, where I'm going to live, or you know, what house, what job, often it's fear that, that is the you know, most underpinning level. You know, do I stay in this job? I hate this job. Well, it's safe. Um, and so I'm always just coming back to that, che- that, that checklist. Uh, am I making a decision out of faith or out of fear? In 2015, when it kicked off, I wanted my family to leave the country. I didn't want them to die or get raped or get traumatized. But I said, we cannot leave because if we leave, every expat's going to leave because we're kind of the senior people out there. Uh, and, 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 and it might be sensible to leave, but we'll only leave if, if it's the right thing to do. And beautifully, God ordained it that my five-year-old swallows and popcorn into his lung and he, he was breathing like that. And he needed, he needed an operation to remove that. And so they had to get on the next plane out. That was the only U.S. pediatrician left in the country's advice. You need to get on the next plane. So they all left. 
and so that was the Lord orchestrating them leaving and, and, uh, and then thousands of people praying around the, around the world and on the day of his operation <laughs> he coughed and out came this kernel of popcorn and uh, you know that was God's miracle the doctors would say that's impossible that was you know, ten days later uh, but that was, I was it was so important for us to choose faith not fear and then moving back to the country uh, a few months later they had a term in England at school I asked all our guys in Brindley shall I bring them back they said don't, don't you dare apart from one all the others said don't you dare it's way too dangerous I said Lord what does faith look like maybe it's the correct decision but what does faith look like in this situation and I, we prayed fasted and sought the Lord and on the last day of our seeking the Lord Lizzie and I we did it for a week I said Lord this is the we both had a peace to go back when our guys said don't you dare it's too dangerous and that week, 168 people had been killed in the capital in broad daylight. It was this most fearful day. So logically, we should not have been going back. But the Lord gave both of us a peace about returning. And I went for a last prayer walk. I said, Lord, you know, this is the heaviest decision I've ever had to make as a husband and as a father. If anything goes wrong when we go back, I, no one will ever forgive me. And I'll have to live with it for the rest of my life. So please, in your mercy, give me a sign. And I was walking along Southampton Common. And I was walking on one path, another man came walking along another path, and our, our paths converged, converged at the exact same moment, and we walked together. He'd been a missionary in Pakistan, he'd had death threats like I had death threats, he had child kidnap issues, and all the sorts of stuff that I'd be wrestling with. And I was like, Father, within a 300 mile radius, you couldn't have handpicked one person to be at that exact moment, in that exact same place. And again, that's the goodness of God. And we went back, and it was so important to be there through those horrific times, incarnating the message, you know not just moving to the, the safety of the suburbs and funny enough I say that I've literally this week moved to, the, to, <laughs> to a suburb so that's the challenge of my ongoing desire to you know live a rad- radical discipleship but living by faith not by fear so every decision just weighing it up you know is this, is this the spirit of God or is this some other spirit or is it it's just it's my, my angst or whatever that's motivating me and being honest before God and uh, he guides how do you discern those things because that's really tricky isn't it when you have all these competing thoughts and feelings and motivations and desires, how do you discern the will of God? Well, I think that's definitely a, a challenge, but um, I, I, I think, you know, giving him time to speak is a massive one. So in that incident, we'd, you know, we'd given a, a, a week to actively, proactively seeking his will. Um, and I think, you know, people always want the flashing lights, and, and, and sometimes that happens. I think that's the exception. Um, I think sometimes we've just got to step out and use our common sense and, and be seeking the Lord, and and uh, he, and He just says go. And I, you know, there's, there's not the only right way, but I will journey with you, and uh, we'll we'll make some beautiful tapestry together. And I, I'm just so grateful to still be alive, and you know, grateful people are happy people, and joy can transcend the difficulties of circumstances if we, you know, I thought I'd, I'd be blind because this guy said he's going to cut out my eyes I thought I'd be dead uh, when this guy was trying to kill me and, and no, this, I'm alive and, and I can see and I don't have to walk five miles with a jerry can on my head to get clean water and I can read and write as I think of a, a 15 year old girl in one of our youth camps who confessed to sleeping with a priest to get three pounds for her school fees and I don't judge her at all because you know, I mean, I would have done that because otherwise I'd be illiterate in first grade. You know, there's no room to judge. But you know, I go through all the grace gifts of God in my life when I'm tempted to self pity or discouragement. Uh, and uh, yeah, I've got freedom to share the gospel in this nation. There's 250 million Christians don't have that freedom in the world. And all those different gifts we've got. And he says, you know, in view of God's mercies, get on the altar, be surrendered to me, and that's the best place to be. Can you tell me about some of the obstacles to faith that people in Burundi are facing? So you talked a bit about witchcraft. Is that the main challenge for people? Um, A a big challenge to people would be hypocrisy of religion. So um, I've got to be vaguely careful on how I say this because um, I don't want to talk politics purely because it's a very delicate situation. But certainly um, every Tom, Dick and Harry is sort of self-proclaiming themselves as a, as, a, as a believer and then there's sometimes an inconsistency between what is said and what is lived out and so there's it's it's hard to see something and think okay so that guy is apparently a follower of Jesus but he's living like that so there's it, it, I from within the tent if you like I'm ex- would be very dis- disillusioned about, about faith and, and the proliferation of new churches so 
in, two, in 1993 when the genocide happened there were 12 denominations now there's 550 so there's been an explosion of new churches well pretty much every church not quite but almost every church started out of a division and an argument so, so that's just a lot of arguments and a lot of angst and, and, uh, and so a lot of reason to not find the message attractive because I mean Jesus prayed to me that we would be one and we're not we're not exactly living like we're one so I, I think that would be a big one um, um, I mean Islam is growing very fast in general um, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, growing it's a, it's a nominally Catholic nation in general uh, but a lot of that is and there's some lovely on fire uh, Catholics but a lot a lot of that is a veneer over um, witchcraft and stuff so um, people often leaving that for something more vibrant and dynamic you talked about some of the difficult circumstances uh, you've encountered um, some of the dramatic things you know, death threats etc was that the worst day of your ministry? what the death threats? Mm, the day that someone said they were going to come to your house and blind you um, no I mean it was it was it was, it was dramatic, it was scary, I did have nightmares I went and slept with a friend who happened to be the US security attaché um, he worked out ways of you know, communicating, because I was on a loud motorbike in terms of not ending up being caught by him but uh, I mean no I mean, I, I, as I look back now, I'm mean, one of the most thankful moments of my life because it, it, that was the epiphany of recognising that you know, I am so uh, likely to die and, and so I'm going to live ready and I think you know often we can sleepwalk in the west in spiritual apathy and that wasn't a luxury or a curse afforded to me and so I was, I'm very grateful for that now I, I, if I think of sucker punches and real lows they would be um, a friend forging my signature for one of the groups we supported and stealing $15,000 which is a lot to anyone but out there that was a huge sum of money which she duly completely wasted and ended up being put in prison contracting AIDS and and, and, and it was just horrific because it destroyed the fledgling organisation we've been supporting uh, just took it out for two years it has bounced back but that was a sucker punch um, having you know someone you love get murdered is obviously not a nice thing to happen having someone who's giving themselves in the ministry so much mentoring discipling street kids and then someone goes and one of the guys who's mentoring goes and rapes his daughter you know that's a sucker blow uh, but he has never gave up not even under much family pressure to, to just look after his family and uh, um, yeah I mean, two years of parasite or chronic fatigue never really worked out what it was but it's interesting that even in those two years you know that was potentially the most useful Full, not that that is how we should view our lives but that might have been the most useful season in my life to the Lord uh, because during that time I wrote uh, probably my most influential book Choose Life and that was th- it was a devotional 365 readings for radical disciples but you know my choice in that incident as I was laid low for two years lying in bed I didn't lie the whole time in bed because after a while I thought well you know I've just got to get up and get on with life but it was a real joy sucker uh, joy killer but my choice is that I'm, am I going to choose self pity or just Lord, use this time? And out of that time came this book that you know, tens of thousands of people are journeying with every day. And, and, and you know, are they choosing faith or fear or urgency or apathy or guilt or gratitude or you know all these different choices? So um, yeah, no, they've been they've been blows in the mix, um, and yet um, overall, you know, the testimony would be God is the one who calls you is faithful, and He will do it. One that's one Thessalonians five. 24, you know, we follow Jesus, John 10, I've come, you have life and life to the full, life in abundance. And I look back, Ephesians 3, took Paul prays to the God of the immeasurably more than all you can ask for or imagine. I look back on the last 20 years and think, he has done immeasurably more than anything I could have dreamt. And what a privilege to be able to say that, not to my own glory, but, you know, we have had, we, our, our work is, continues to be nation shaping from the top down, from the bottom up. It's lovely, I was preaching once at a meeting with all the top dogs it's the National Prayer Breakfast so the President forces everyone to come so they're all there 
And afterwards, this lady came up to me and said, Simoni, Simoni, ora new book. It's fine, it's fine. Do you remember me? I said, sorry, yes, I don't remember you. She said, well, 15 years ago, I was on your youth camp, and now I'm a member of parliament. And I was like, yeah, bring it on, Lord, because, you know, that's a long-term vision for the transformation of the nation. You want to see the youth rise up, being the present and the future, marching to the beat of a different drum, not being into nepotism, ethnic hatred, corruption, all that sort of stuff. And, and here she is living it out. So now when I go back to any school, I'm like... Guys, don't have small dreams. Fifteen years time, you know that could be you. You're going to be a, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be a lawyer, you're going to be fighting for righteousness in your country. You're going to be a businesswoman, you know, creating opportunities to grow the economy. Don't have small dreams. The Lord wants to use each one of you. So I'm so overwhelmed with gratitude. And in terms of Christians here in the UK who are thinking, wow, all these stories, this this excites me. You know, apart from maybe the death threats. Um, I want to go out and do this. I want to be part of, you know, frontline mission. I want to be hearing from God, doing His work in in some of the poorest areas. How do you think people can avoid the white saviour mentality? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, I would straight away say um, just just read up as much about it as possible. Get alongside people. Don't think. Don't have overinflated expectations of what you're going to achieve in two weeks. I remember going out to Brazil and thinking I was going to save seven million street kids in three weeks, and you know that was just absurd. Um, and clearly, I'm being slightly tongue in cheek, but I did think I could do a whole lot of stuff, whereas I did virtually nothing. But it did impact me. So short-term missions tends to impact the person that goes rather than what they end up doing. And that's for a purpose, hopefully, to lead to a radically different life. So I came back from Brazil and I thought, well, I, I'm selling my Wi-Fi system. I, you know, I'm going to give my music collection away because I'm so desperate for those guys to be helped. And, uh, and it led to a different prioritization of, of resources. But I'd say to people, you know, it's great to experience the body of Christ and its breadth and diversity. I'd encourage everyone to take a trip out. I'd encourage parents to take their kids out because uh, it will change. It will stop them being moany about everything if they see someone you know this week I, I, I one of the guys we work with he walks 40 kilometers a day to get to and from school it takes him five hours I mean that's very fast walking that's that's five and a half mile an hour pace so it's kind of almost jogging but that's the nearest school he's got 40 kilometers so 20 kilometers each way what's that that's sort of 13 miles that's the hunger for education so if our kids go out there and they're exposed to that um, it's very very help, helpful and healthy for them and, and then you bring back lessons of you know, reprioritizing simplicity and, and, and passion for Jesus and gratitude and all those things are needed over here. So I'd encourage anyone to, uh, to do it, but actually to think, you know, most of us are not called to go cross-culturally, but you are called to go to your neighbors. So I've literally this week moved into a house in Bath and I am on a mission to get to know all my neighbors. So there's Jean next door, there's Pat the other side and, and like I want to be a light there and yeah I mean not that people have to do this I don't need much sleep so at 5.30 in the morning I am prayer walking up and down the street It's the, there's an intentionality which we can have or not have um, but I'm like the Lord's put me here and I want to live intentionally and and it's not an accident and I don't feel guilty about it but on some level you know if I'm going to be in the street for 10 years I will be held to account for these people having hope or not having hope and having the truth claims of Christ presented to them so what am I going to do and you know so we're going to have a, a house warming thing in a few weeks you know we, and the longer we wait to do it, it means we won't do it so I'll say that and you can hold me to account next time we talk you know we've got to live this out and find other people on the street to do life with and incarnate the message and show that we value people above stuff and all those lessons that I've learned over the last 20 years and so why are you coming back to the UK well, it's um, my children's education that uh, made it happen. Uh, so my eldest is 13, and, and their, edu- their classroom education was definitely suffering really. Their life education wasn't. But they needed to get into an English system at some stage rather than Belgian, uh, Belgian colony. And also, the Lord just made it, in terms of time, beautifully clear. I got the chance to hand over the ministry to a man who's not an amazing Af- African leader that would be patronising he's an amazing world leader he's more impressive than I would say anyone I've ever met so what an incredible privilege to be able to say that and say that hand on heart as the truth that I have literally had the privilege of handing on the ministry to someone who's way more capable than me and he's a local and so you know he's the right colour uh, and it's his country his culture his proverbs his language and so he's going to do the job better than me he can stand on my shoulders see further do more 
incredibly strategic, trained as a lawyer. So I'm, I'm strong big picture and useless on detail, and he's he's strong big picture and brilliant on detail. And so uh, he's taking it on. And so and the Lord made that very clear. You know, this guy had led a pastor's four kids, four out of five, the pastor's wayward kids, he'd led to Christ. And so that pastor fasted for him for 40 days to thank the Lord and say, give me a message for an Esfor. And at the end of that 40 days, that grateful pastor was so grateful that an Esfor had brought these four kids to Christ, came to an Esfor very weak and said to an Esfor, I've got two messages, two messages for you. Now, the backstory is that he didn't know that I'd ask an escort to take over the message, and he didn't know me at all. And the two messages, he said, the Lord had told him to tell an escort, an escort, I believe God's told you to leave what you're doing and go work for someone else. And the second thing is, he's given you a twin to change the nation with, and that twin's name is Simon. So, boom, you know, mind-blowing confirmation straight from the Lord. And so we know at this stage, may we continue to be at what we are on track. The Lord has spoken, it's clear. And we're being used to rock that nation for Jesus. Well, you've been travelling back and forth from countries in Africa to the UK for the past two decades. What's your view of the UK church? Why are we not seeing more people saved? Well, I think there's some you know, fabulous, hardcore gospel men and women who are busting a gut to be faithful. Um, and so straight away I want to acknowledge that. That's, I mean, this week we're meeting wonderful people doing great work but it is just harder there's no doubt we're in a culture a post-christian culture where there's not that same openness at all there's cynicism there's fear there's there's scorn um, there's distraction people haven't got time um, they don't want to give the time so it's just a, a very different context so not to bash uh, the british church at, at all it's just got masses of challenges and in a hyper individualistic society as well you know, it, 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 the, our gospel is, is is struggling to get airtime, and then factoring relativism and and you know any anyone's truth goes, and then you know cultural onslaught in terms of culture affecting lives more than, than scriptural standards. So it's just very very difficult. I think the challenge for me coming back in is I want to model and live an incarnational spirituality that that is humble. Um, but the prioritised people over stuff I've already said that so time you know we're all very busy but if you strip away our busyness maybe two hours in that day for a lot of people is, is social media so that's not business that's just wasting your life I mean literally and I say that as someone who's last week come off Twitter and uh, Instagram because I, it was just killing my soul Twitter was just making me depressed not clinically but it was depressing and Instagram was like oh my goodness I'm starting to care about how many likes I've got and that is killing my soul so that's a waste of time I stay on Facebook because actually I can make quite a lot of money on Facebook for Burundi so that's just a different beast um, but you know are we really busy um, some of us are totally busy but again that busyness might involve an hour or, or two hours of television a day so it's like you know I, I was talking to a ministry leader here about um, the scouts and and as we look at youth work in this country we some people say people don't want to go um, to youth clubs I mean that is just wrong there's a waiting list of 50,000 people for the scouts in England right now and why are there 50,000 kids that can't go to scouts it's because there aren't the leaders because we're all watching box sets on Netflix and giving all our time sacrificing at the altar of Netflix or Amazon Prime or whatever it is and, 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 and I don't want to slip into that and that's the challenge uh, that I think people living in it just don't see it so I often talk about you know that frog in the pan of water put that frog in a boiling pan of water he jumps out because it's death it's too hot but you put that same frog in the same pan in the same water but cold water and you just warm it up slowly heat it up slowly till it's boiling that frog cooks literally is killed because he hasn't noticed the, the increments and the slow increase of temperature and I think coming from the outside and critiquing the culture I, I'm like that frog in the boiling pan of water whereas you guys over here invariably uh, have, have been slow cooked and it's insidious and dangerous and so we need to be very awake very alert that's why I, I feel the need to get out of the crack of dawn because I, I want to get it's so important there's a war going on and I've listened to literal bombs falling in Burundi a lot and lots of gunfire uh, uh, and yet back in England I see bombs falling all over the place they're just different bombs of apathy and comfort and relativism and, and distraction and, uh, and if we haven't got eyes to see then we will get taken out so ask me again in a year's time how I'm getting on but it, you know, I want to stay alert I want to surround myself with people 
So for those church leaders and people in churches who are trying to live it out, we can't do it on our own. We are more than conquerors. That's we, it's not me. We do it together. If you want to go fast, go alone. This is an African proverb. If you want to go far, go together. And I want to go far and together. And I say this, you know, bear in mind that it's the biggest tension in my marriage is, is that I'm so fast and my wife's, I was going to say so slow, she's more normal. And so sometimes I've really lost her when we go off, off, off on a date because, uh, you know, I've gone so far ahead and, and the date hasn't got off to a good start. We want to go far, so let's go together rather than fast going alone. And so we live this incarnation together. So we find a couple of other families on the street. That's what we're trying to do right now. In fact, I know that too other Christ followers on our street families and they get together and pray together and incarnate the values and, and, uh, and, and seek to re- reflect in something very, very beautiful with an intentionality that doesn't come unless we're disciplined. You know, the military metaphors in the Bible are there for a reason and we need to be signed up and disciplined and, and that goes against my nature because I'm much more laid back in, 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 the, na- in the natural and, you know, I want to be lazy but uh, the stakes are high. We've got an urgent commission, an urgent mandate, and we need to take it very, very seriously. Because I don't, I know that no one wants to get to the end of their life, be sat there in a recliner with a shriveled soul and loads of stuff, and think I just missed it. I played it safe. I wasted so much time. You know, that's not a compelling vision. Whereas the vision I'm just painting right now of, of urgency and passion and focus and and, uh, and worship and you know serving the King, that that is very compelling. But it takes everything. So the next few months you'll be settling back in, getting the children ready. Does that mean no more adventures for the Gilbo family for a while? Uh, well, hopefully life is all adventure. So for this last year we've been in 34 countries, um, homeschooling, preaching around the world. So um, I think we probably just need things to be more normal, um, have some stability being in one place. You know, this is probably a 10-year chapter, unless the Lord does something dramatic. Um, we, we, we will be obedient to go anywhere, but I suspect that this is literally us um, bedding down in a community, getting stuck in, um, embracing the challenges of see, seeking to live passionately and radically and wholeheartedly in a culture which um, is much more resistant and challenging than it was in Burundi. I mean, Burundi was very challenging in, in totally different ways as, as you can you know, get from what I've shared already, but I actually feel more concerned for my own spiritual well-being coming here because I know it'll be, it'll be different challenges and, and more insidious ones that I need to be more on my guard with. So priorities, bedding into finding a local church where we can not consume, um, but where we can get stuck in and serve and finding a bunch of men for me that I can really go deep with accountability, finding a group of people, younger guys I can mentor, you know, um, passing on as much stuff as possible and finding some older folks to look up to as well. Well, sadly, that's all we've got time for today. But see you same time, same place next week.